Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to cup number 10 of Cosmic Coffee brought to you by Lowell Observatory. I'm Jeff Hall. I'm an astronomer and the director of the observatory, uh, broadcasting to you this morning from my office here on Mars Hill in Flagstaff. And joining us uh, this week as, as our guest on Cosmic Coffee is the sole trustee of the observatory, uh, William Lowell Putnam, who goes by Lowell, and he is coming to us from his residence in New Hampshire. Um, now, first of all, as you know, uh, at the start of every Cosmic Coffee, we give a little uh, shout out and encouragement to one of our local uh, coffee shops. And, and this morning I went down to, if, if you've been in Flagstaff for any amount of time, uh, you this is a Flagstaff institution, which would be Biff's Bagels down on uh, South Beaver, just south of the tracks near the, uh, the Mountain Line Station. Um, they're back open for business and doing it in quite a thoughtful way. And I got a nice dark blend, also supplied by Fire Creek Coffee and a delicious bagel. So go out and support our, our businesses who are doing their, their level best to get back on their feet uh, in a safe and responsible way. Um, so the, now the reason um, we have our trustee on the show today is May 28th uh, is our birthday. Uh, 126 years ago today, Percival Lowell arrived in Flagstaff on the train to set up the observatory. And Lowell is, if I get this right, the great grand nephew of Percival. Right. And I thought we'd start this morning. Um, you know, obviously neither you nor even your dad overlapped with Percival, but your grandfather certainly did. And just some, some thoughts about this interesting character who built this institution would be a good place to start. <laughs> well, certainly. And uh, happy to, to talk a little bit about some of the family history. Percival was the oldest of uh, five children. His parents were uh, extremely wealthy. Uh, they were actually in some ways a, a merger of two of the largest mill manufacturing companies in the United States, the Bigelow Lawrence Mills and the Lowell Massachusetts Mills. And um, Percival was always in love with astronomy. Uh, he was about three years old when the comet Donati uh, sped across the skies of the United States and his, and his longest permanent memory was of his mother taking him at about age three up the stairs and he saw the comet uh, through, through the doorway into the roof. And that was uh, started his lifelong love of astronomy. Uh, but he was also the oldest son and at that point in time was expected to do things in the family business. And so he went to Harvard um, and then went to MIT, where his professor said he was the brightest mathematical mind of his generation, which is pretty good from MIT professors. And then he did work for the family businesses for a couple of years, but he really wanted to go travel and explore. And so he left and went to Japan. Um, most well-to-do uh, Bostonites went to Europe for a grand tour, as it was called, for a year abroad. Percival wanted to go to the Orient. It was much more mysterious and interesting. And so he went to Japan and Korea, uh, wrote some incredible literature that was very well received, published in two books about his adventures there. Um, and then um, in 1892, came back to the United States uh, he had been keeping up with astronomy and was uh, reading all the talk about Mars. And therefore, he decided that he would take over uh, for uh, Schiaparelli and um, continue looking at Mars from here. So uh, he sent A.O. Douglas, Andrew Douglas, out from Harvard to go find a place where an observing could be done. And... That's one of the, the, the main things that continues to uh, apply to Lowell Observatory, which is he didn't try and cite it where it was convenient. He tried to put it where it would do the best seeing. And that was in the desert southwest. And Douglas, after searching around Arizona and looking in northern Mexico as well, settled on Flagstaff. And so he then told... Percival and Percival told him to hurry up and build it, build a start building an observatory out there, um, so that in 1894 uh, uh, 
he could come out and start doing observing of Mars. And indeed, at the end of May, he stepped off the train in Flagstaff, and there we go. Hmm. I don't know what that is. There's lovely piano music to accompany Percival's arrival. I guess that it's well timed, but unfortunately, <laughs> it makes no sense. To me, so, anyhow, there we go. Yeah, right. And so, Flagstaff at that interval was at that point was certainly not convenient, right? A town of about 800, and uh, here in the Arizona Territory, Arizona wasn't even a state yet, and. Um, and we've been a part of the community now for 126 years. And, and I would hope and, and believe um, have a very close and good relationship with um, what is now the first international dark sky city. So, so yeah, Percival was uh, uh, quite adventurous to, um, and there's actually, uh, there's a question coming in from Joan Winan asking, um, how tall is the observatory and perhaps, um, I, 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 and I suspect, would I be correct in saying how high, what the, is the altitude of the observatory? Yeah, that, right. that would be my guess, yeah. Right, so Flagstaff itself is about 7,000 feet. Mars Hill, which is where the observatory was located and Percival is observing, is another 200, 250 feet above Flagstaff on what is now known as Observatory Mesa. Right, uh, right. And of course, our newer um, uh, facilities uh, are a higher altitude, uh, and the LDT is getting close to 8,000 feet above sea level out in uh, out in Happy Jack. Right, right, yep. And we are. I'm looking out my window at the Clark Telescope right now. I think that's right at about 7,250 feet. And so, you know, a lot of people think of Arizona as a blast furnace, and a lot of it is. But up here at the high elevation, I mean, it's going to be about 85 this afternoon. That's that's a pretty hot day for Flagstaff. So, so Lowell set up um, this observatory. Oh, oh, and there's a question, what is LDT? We're gonna talk about that a little later in the show. That stands for Lowell Discovery Telescope, our, our largest research telescope. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but so let's, uh, I, here's a, a picture that I took. Let me get, let me advance the slide here. Just about uh, an hour ago, this is down the hall from my office. So Percival established the observatory and, and, and set up its governance structure and the sort of the, the rules by which it'll operate. And one rather unusual thing he did was to have the observatory governed by a sole trustee. And you know, normally a CEO like me would report to a board of directors, but that's not the case. I'm, I'm here basically with my boss, who's a single uh, governing officer of the institution. So why did Lowell do that? Um, that's actually a, a family tradition. Um, the other sole trusteeship in the United States was started, well, three generations before Percival, uh, is called the Lowell Institute. And it is uh, in Boston and it is um, concentrating on non-traditional education um, and preferably free education. It started as a lecture series, uh, continued on to do um, the founded WGBH. If anybody watches public television, they certainly know WGBH. Uh, that was founded by the Lowell Institute. Um, that was established as a sole trusteeship. And the, the, the belief was then, still is, that uh, if you uh, are a sole trustee, you, you, you agreed to take on the job. Um, and you know that you've got nobody else to cover for you so that you will therefore pay a lot of attention to what is going on and care. Um, and so that is sort of the, the, the basis, um, for why a sole trusteeship works very effectively. It also allows for, um, some very, uh, tough decision-making, risky decision-making, um, because you don't have to go to a board for consensus and everything else like that. And certainly the building of the four-meter telescope is an example of a risk that an institution our size, if it had a governing board, would probably never have taken. But having a sole trustee, um, could the sole trustee could decide to do it and, and then bet the farm, as indeed that's what happened. 
So. Yep, indeed. And that that's certainly risk with a capital R given the magnitude of that project. And we'll come back to that in a bit. A uh, question has come in from your David Connell. Uh, good morning, <laughs> David. Um, David would like to know what is your earliest astronomical memory? Um, well, I, I, I have a couple as a small child. Uh, my grandparents, um, uh, my grandparent Putnam's had a uh, house out in the country in north central Massachusetts. And I do remember um, going out in evenings with my grandfather, who was at that point in time the trustee, although as he was just my grandfather, I didn't know about that sort of thing at the time, and looking at the stars and him talking about what, was, what we were seeing and what was out there. Um, and then when I was a, a teenager, I very, have very sharp memories of there was a total solar eclipse, uh, that, that I got to watch. And that was just an incredible experience as indeed a number of, of us and our friends all went up to Madras just a few years ago and got to experience that. And, uh, just, those are just phenomenal things. And anybody who has seen a total solar eclipse a partial solar eclipse is just not the same thing. It just isn't the same. And um, I don't know why. I've got to turn off our phone system somehow. I'm like, ah, okay, it's, it's the phone. Yeah. No, I, right. And we were trying to send that message before the eclipse. You know, 99% will not do. I mean, that right. you have to have 100. And when you do, you know, I remember after totality ended up there in Madras. And I was wandering around the football field, just thanking people were coming. And several people who had not seen one were right. literally in tears as they came up to that because the, the experience is so overwhelming. And, you know, I think that's those kinds of things go right back to, to probably what Percival experienced, seeing the comet that changed the course of his life. And, and of course, that's what we're trying to do day in and day out here when we're able to do it. So, all right. So, so let's go to to some of the principal figures, you know, Lowell founded this place. And, and, you know, today, of course, we have an outstanding research faculty. And, and I'm delighted that we've uh, been able to, to attract such quality uh, minds to, to, to Mars Hill. But that's been the case since, since Percival Lowell's days. And, um, you know, here are, here are two from the early days of the observatory that are certainly some of the largest uh, figures in, 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 that in, were involved with fundamental dis discoveries. Certainly, and and on on the left there is is Vesto V M Slifer, um, and he was uh, he and his brother uh, E C Slifer were actually um, only sort of temporary hires. They weren't. He, Purcell wasn't really sure he was going to keep them, um, but uh, but but they came out and and I guess that definition goes to show what happens because they came out and then they never left. Uh, the Slifers were here uh, for the entire rest of their professional career and became well established in Flagstaff. Um, EC served as mayor. Um, so, uh, you know, and they owned the hotel uh, downtown. So it, that it's, it's, it's amazing what happens when you finally end up on Mars Hill, you don't go away. It's our current director, you know, it, I was going to say, I came here in 1992 on a temporary three year appointment. Um, so yeah. <laughs> but, um, the, what, what VM's history is also typical of, of the philosophy of Percival Lowell in terms of finding, uh, people who really want to do good research giving them the best equipment that you can get and then letting them go do that research. Um, and in VM's case, uh, Percival bought uh, the spectrograph uh, that was the best of its kind uh, at the time. And while he had some things he wanted VM to look at for planetary research purposes using it, um, he also encouraged VM to go and do observations of those strange things that at the time were called spiral nebulae. And that, that is what gave us the proof that the universe is expanding. VM's measurements of, of the uh, recessional velocity, um, or in some cases, like Andromeda, it's processional velocity, uh, proved that things are moving in many directions and at quite rapid rates of speed. And that 
basically blew up uh, was proof that the that the then current models of the universe were just not correct, and there needed to be new models that could explain this. And 15 years later, Edwin Hubble came out with his theory, um, although uh, he did admit later on in life that it was uh, VM's work that was the basis that gave him the ability to to, to come up with his theory. Um, mm -hmm. I wish edited it earlier, maybe then we would have the Hubble Slifer telescope um, or Hubble Slifer Lemaitre telescope. I don't know how many different names we want to put on it, but um, but Slifer's work and, and, and his research is certainly of the same level and uh, that it goes with those two other names. And, uh, and yeah, and I, I just love, you know, there's occasional papers in the literature that are just so fundamental and you know, two pages long. And Slifer's uh, early paper, where he lists out, he presents his data with the the re a recessional, the extraordinary mm -hmm. recessional speeds in most of these galaxies. And right at the end, there's this little comment. I'm going to paraphrase, but it's something like, you know, we, we ought to look into this more because there could be something important here. And you know, he didn't quite know what he was seeing, but it's one of the. I've always found it one of the great understatements in the literature. And and he hired. Yeah, the, the, gentleman, the gentleman we see on the right there. So Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, and one of the things that I always find interesting people to think about is that when Clyde Tombaugh came to work at the observatory, he, he had not gone to college. And so he came out as a, as a Kansas farm boy, an amateur astronomer, very dedicated to, uh, to his craft, very, um, persistent in, in accuracy and, um, and given his youthful eyes, cause he's only in his early twenties when this happens, uh, it, he was the perfect person for the job of doing the, the incredibly painstaking comparison work, um, using the blink comparator, um, and, uh, to uh, his significant credit, he never made a mistake. He didn't call it wrong. He didn't find a false positive. He only, when he said he found something, he found something. Um, and um, I think that that's, you know, it's, it's sort of this unique progression of Percival could do the calculations, but it took somebody to do the observational work to, to get us to where we needed to be. Of course, the funny thing is that Percival's calculations were based on bad data from other people. Um, and so as the, the line goes, Percival was looking for a ghost and Clyde Tombaugh went and found it for him. Uh, right. And, and, and within a couple of degrees of where Percival predicted it would be, which is one of those weird, incredible, uh, unlikely things that, mm -hmm. that happens. And we've mentioned this on Cosmic Coffee before, you know, really unlikely things happen. And, you know, they, they don't Serend happen. Serendipity, serendipity is always interesting to watch. Um, right. And I love the story. Um, it, in fact, it, uh, it always gives me goosebumps to think that, you know, this is the director's office here and Slifer was sitting right here, um, uh, you know, 90 years ago. And Clyde, this young kid who never been to college, walks in here and says, Dr. Slifer, I have found your planet X. And just the the significance and, and history in, in this place just uh, it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the chuckle I always get following that is, of course, so Clyde Tombaugh then gets celebrated as having discovered a planet and then goes back to the University of Kansas <laughs> to pursue a degree in astronomy. Now, I've got to believe that the board that was reviewing his PhD thesis <laughs> was going to have a really hard time not approving the work of the only living person in the world who had discovered a planet. It's just, you know, it's, it's no bad line for your resume for sure. <laughs> All right. So let's, um, from the discovery of, of, you know, Pluto and, and then going farther back, of course, the, those first redshifts were obtained with the Clark refractor right up the hill here, um, probably the most fundamental scientific work it ever did. Um, and that's, that was the flagship telescope of our, our early days. And now we talked earlier about 
um, a somewhat more modern telescope. And this is the other bookend that's now our, our flagship research telescope and definitely an example of, of betting the firm because we were pretty sure when we started this project, it was going to cost at least $20 million. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the Lowell Discovery Telescope, the LDT, uh, formerly known as the DCT, for some people who've heard that acronym. And for a single institution to decide it was going to build a four meter telescope, uh, nobody, no single institution had ever done that before. Uh, nobody's done it since. They're, building telescopes of this size um, are, are major undertaking, multi year, and um, Murphy can show up anywhere in the process and, and put you at risk, cause delays, um, and possibly, obviously, cost millions and millions of dollars. Um, and, and this was uh, a, a choice. Um, we didn't have to do this. We could have done other ways to continue the observing capabilities of the, of, of the observatory and for our research staff. But it is in keeping with what Percival did, which is you buy the best equipment, you make sure that you make it available to your staff on an ongoing and sustained basis. Uh, and that's how good long-term research gets done. And so um, uh, my father, as the trustee, was confronted with this situation in the early 90s. And um, the, uh, the, the, really, in his case, the only decision that made sense was to take the risk of building what turned out to be a $53 million telescope. So somebody's original estimations were shut slightly off, shall we say. Um, but the team that built it did a phenomenal job. Um, this telescope came online faster than any other four meter that I'm aware of. Um, and it behaves incredibly well. People, not only our researchers who use it, but uh, our partner institutions, their people have used telescopes all around the world. And they say that this is the best behaved four meter telescope in the world. And well, you may say, okay, so it behaves nicely, so what? But that is a key indicator of how scientifically productive it can be as a, because it's very efficient. You point it, you tell it to go point at a particular object in the sky and it will quickly move and lock center on that target. And that's not, uh, that's not the habit of other four meter or other large class telescopes. And so anything that costs you time in your observing nights is, is something you, you want to avoid. And to have a telescope that is, as, as I said, well behaved as this one um, allows people to be much more scientifically productive. And right. Um, and for a lot of these ongoing programs where you're doing a large set of targets and slewing around frequently, that gain in efficiency is, is tremendous. And, you know, our former director, Bob Millis, sometimes referred to this as a Swiss army knife of telescopes um, from the way it's uh, instrument cube is designed, allowing a whole range of projects from, you know, imaging of of faint galaxies to now with the new uh, Yale instrument hunting for hunting for Earths around sun-like stars, which seems a singularly appropriate thing to be doing at Percival's observatory. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we're really thrilled to have this telescope um, in operation. As you say, uh, it, it costs us about $16,000 a night to run this thing. And that's, you know, all of the fixed expenses, all of the staff to make it go. Currently, we're operating, we've just reopened it after a, a virus-induced shutdown. We're back into four nights uh, on, three nights off, and um, hopefully eventually, as it's we consider it safe and prudent to do so, we'll have all the photons flowing through once again. But, you know, as they say, change begets change, and as if we weren't sufficient gluttons for punishment with this, now we've got this. And, and really, this is pointing to this very integrated mission we have of doing uh, leading research and astronomical discovery, but you know Percival was was adamant about communicating the results of that and and general scientific principles to the public at large. Absolutely, he was a a uh, both prolific and and skilled writer and also a presenter, 
And he firmly believed uh, that doing good science means communicating about that science in a manner that engages the general public and that gets them excited about why that kind of research uh, is being done and, and why it's important and useful. And the result of that is that that has been part of our mission going forward uh, ever since. And so, uh, as you see in the, the upper picture, last year we were uh, fortunate to open the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory uh, to uh, rave reviews from all who have, have gone through it. It's been extremely well received. Uh, that is an incredible collection of telescopes for uh, with eyepieces to allow people to look at just a, a wide variety of, of uh, objects in the sky and different types of objects. And, and as a collection available for general public viewing, it's unmatched in the world. It's, it's, it's pretty yeah. phenomenal. It, it really is beautiful. And, um, you know, in the picture here, which was taken from one of our opening uh, nights last um, September or October, right above the word grand on the banner, you can see that red telescope with the long barrel. That's the eight inch moon raker, which is just um, one of the most arguably the most beautiful telescope I've uh, ever seen. It's it is as much a work of art as it is anything in terms of a scientific instrument. It's, it just has a very striking presence. and. Yeah. and and very good. So, so this facility um, was in round numbers about $4 million and literally just over two years from a, a proposition at our, our board of advisors meeting in 2017 to opening night. And we raised over $4 million thanks to our outstanding development team um, and got it done. And, and it's, uh, I hate seeing it sitting there idle, but um, we had a really nice um, live stream, uh, interactive remote yeah. stargazing last Thursday. We're going to continue doing that. Um, the staff on duty, um, Haley and Danielle and Sarah and, and Heather did just a spectacular job. And so we're looking forward to at least bringing that to visitors until we can reopen it um, to, to the public. And then at the bottom, I, I, sometimes I call the, the Open Deck Observatory here the appetizer. And then below is the, the entree that we're currently. So in, in, in order to engage with the public, I mean, Percival went and visited, traveled around the country and, and talked a lot and was very, very popular as a speaker. But the visitor program in Flagstaff and the modern 20th century travel capabilities that exist now as compared to when he was traveling around by train and, and ship, if he went to Europe, um, means that we are now getting a hundred plus thousand visitors a year up on Mars Hill. Um, now, obviously the coronavirus is putting into that for the time being, but um, our visitor facilities for the past were built in the mid 1990s and designed to handle 50 to 60,000 visitors a year. And obviously when you get up to a hundred thousand, things get a little cramped. And that has led us to uh, building the, uh, the Marley, Astronomy Discovery Center, um, which you see the, uh, the architects rendering there in the lower part. Uh, this will give us the ability to handle approximately 150 to 200,000 visitors per year, and it has room to expand. Um, and it's got some incredible features that I think are going to make people uh, just be wildly impressed. Uh, on the roof, we're going to use the fact that Flagstaff has international dark sky recognition to use the sky of Flagstaff as a natural planetarium. Um, now, given that it is Flagstaff, and particularly in the wintertime, it can be a little chilly, we're going to make sure we have heated seats there. Um, mm -hmm. But the, uh, the idea of being able to uh, lean back in some, some comfortable chairs there and look up at the sky and get a guided tour of, of the sky there is, um, I think going to be just an incredibly unique experience. Um, and, and then we will have the, the theater to exhibit halls, uh, classroom capabilities. So this is going to really open up our ability to engage the public in a variety of formats. Yep. Yep. And we are fortunately, you know, as, as we're completely kind of paralyzed at, at the moment by the virus, um, we are, we have been at a stage where 
a lot of the, the work we need to be doing on this new visitor center can sort of go along anyway. We're in, in site design and permitting discussions with the city. Um, several of us on the staff have been uh, plotting out the story that we're going to try to be telling in all of the exhibits. And, and we're really, we're tilting that in the direction of, we, of, of wanting our guests to understand that, you know, you are literally a child of the cosmos. You know, that the atoms in your body were forged in stars far away billions of years ago. And we're literally contemplating ourselves as we look up into these dark skies and try to understand um, what's going on. So, so the planned opening time scale is, is spring of 2023. Um, so far, um, the virus has not impacted that deadline. You know, we will mm -hmm. see what we see and see how things, uh, when things sort themselves out. And, and hopefully by 2023, we will be to the point um, where we'll be able to welcome large groups again to the campus without mm -hmm. any concern. But we're certainly not there right now. I um, sort of to, I guess, wrap up the conversation. I took this about an hour ago um, here on campus. It is a gorgeous day out here, but as you can see, not a soul in sight. And we're pretty much uh, locked down. We are developing plans. Our outreach team is coming up with what I think are some really nice plans for dipping our toes back into the water with smaller groups of guests appropriately, you know, kept in, in safe circumstances. But you know we, we've been trying to soldier through the the initial shutdown, keep the team intact as best we can, and just deal with the situation. Yeah, and and I've got to really congratulate you and all the staff for the work that everybody's been doing to figure out ways to get the LDT reopened, uh, to uh, figure out all different kinds of projects that maybe when there's nobody on the campus are the best time to go do them um, so that they can be done and the place can be beautiful and ready for people uh, when we do start to reopen. So, yeah. And, and this actually is one of those. And it's, it's maybe a little bit ironic, you know, I think we've been saying for a couple of years, geez, you know, it would really make a lot of sense to ramp up our online presence, but you know, nobody ever had time to do it until, until the virus in, enforced some, some new, uh, lifestyles on us. And in fact, right now, um, the, the campus looks empty, but when I took this picture, it was actually pretty noisy because there's construction equipment running all over. We're doing some basic civil engineering for the road stub outs toward uh, the new visitor center and um, installing a new visitor walkway um, around the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And it's going to have these beautiful glowstones in it. And I think the uh, the first ones are already in place. So I'll have to go up this evening or tomorrow evening and check them out. So we're, we're still soldiering along and um, we'll continue to, to bring in these programs. So any, any final thoughts you want to offer and then we'll, we'll see if there are any questions. Well, I, as, as I said, it's been, it, as you have said also, it's been a little frustrating not being able to do as much of the public outreach program as we are used to and this time of year in Flagstaff is particularly gorgeous. Um, but we've been getting incredible support from uh, the Friends of Lowell Observatory. And I want to thank everybody who has been so supportive of our mission and, and contributes to helping make it happen. Um, the, that support is, is, means more and more every day. And uh, we very much appreciate it. And we look forward to opening up on the 129th birthday mm -hmm. of the observatory. It's going to be a very big cake, but uh, we'll have a building hopefully there to, to show and share with everybody. Very good. And, and, and I will echo the thanks to all our supporters. And really, although, you know, again, this picture looks pretty quiet, you know, we're pivoting and how we deliver the outreach. You know, the, the nice thing about research is, you know, that's proceeding along because our faculty are cranking along on, papers in their work, albeit from home rather than from office. So really, you know, the heart's beating pretty well. Um, but we really do rely on, on everyone's interest and support to keep that going. So we greatly appreciate it. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any further questions at the moment. So as always, I, I'll say first, thanks Lowell for your time joining us today. Um, and to all of you, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and we look forward to welcome you back to the Hill as soon as we can safely do so. 
till next week. Have a great time and uh, stay safe. Bye.